overwhelmed? Yeah, I think one of the things people don't think about when they think of the border and they see these numbers, the high number of apprehensions, is that most of those people who are caught, or at least a lot of them, are intentionally getting caught. Like they're walking, they're coming over the border and turning themselves over to Border Patrol because they want to make a claim for asylum or whatever else. This is, uh, you know, who God only knows how many people are getting away that we don't we don't know about. And that, that, that's a scary figure. So when I speak to sources, Border Patrol, they, they're worried that the gotaway number is extremely high. It's, a, it's rough to get an, an, an estimation. And this really all just started when the Biden administration came in on day one through executive order, removed the remain in Mexico policy. So now if you're, you know, if you're a migrant, you know, under Trump, it's like, well, why would I pay the cartels and, and put my life in danger only be to, to be told to remain in Mexico for my asylum here? Without that... It literally let open the, the, the floodgates, and that's why we see these record number of apprehensions. And it's, one of the more, I think, fascinating things is when you're down there, these migrants are looking for Border Patrol. They're not trying to invade them. They want, actually want to be apprehended because they know they're going to get released into the United States. That is, that's fascinating how that's, that happens. So you go into the cartel stuff here, and I think I, I look at like uh, the situation in Mexico, and we've seen this over and over again with politicians in Mexico. They'll, they'll say, I'm going to run against the cartels. We're going to put a stop to this. And, you know, three months later, they're just shot in a back alley somewhere and it's over. And then a new person comes in and then they're shot three months later. And there's, there's this so this is a, sort of a weird, like, comfort we find in America, thinking that that's on the other side of the border. That's over there. That's that, you know, that's really bad, but that's over there. But there's no reason to believe it's going to stay over there, especially with the policies we have now. Exactly. So in this documentary, Cartelville USA, we really want to focus on just the issue that these cartels are now living in our in our backyards and are operating in, in the wide open. And mm. all of our policies have emboldened the bad guys. So a, a tactic that we picked up down there at the border is what these cartels do is they'll bring in 200, 300 um, migrants and put them on, let's say, in, in Del Rio or in a McAllen. And what they do is they do this because they want to overwhelm Border Patrol. So when Border Patrol runs into these caravans, they have to separate the minors from the adults. They have to call in process and they have to call in vans. And what this does is it leaves the border even more open than it is. One Border Patrol source told us that the fentanyl that has come into the country just between last year and this year has already increased by 600% because they can't stop these drugs because they're dealing with all these humans that just continue uh, to, to come in. And like I said, record number apprehensions and it's just, to me, it's alarming that the Biden administration has no urgency to solve this issue. They don't. In fact, they, they seem to want the opposite. You know, there's this idea that they were having these huge issues at the border earlier on in the presidency when the media sort of picked up for that for about two weeks. They actually made that into a story. Um, and, you know, the situation has continued. They're just not covering it anymore. Um, but there's an idea that, OK, they don't obviously they want a different outcome when it comes to illegals coming across the border of the Biden administration. They want more illegals here than, than, than Trump did. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, but they didn't necessarily want the public relations disaster of, of, of what's happened on the border. I mean, he's at, what, 26, 27 percent approval on the border. It's his worst category. It's behind even Afghanistan. I mean, it is... It, this is a real crisis politically for the administration as well. It is. And where Biden really took a hit is when those 12,000, 15,000 Haitians came in late September because the mm -hmm. optics just look bad because he started to deport the single <laughs> males. So the left was mad because he was doing this uh, via Title 42, which is a Trump policy. So right. he was losing on the left and then he was losing <laughs> on the right. So optics is it, it's looking bad. Vice President Kamala Harris, the border czar, oh. who has yet to actually go to the border. I mean, she literally stopped by at the, at the airport uh, hangar. I'm like, come and see what, what's, what's going on with these children. Um, the women that we meet who have been sexually assaulted on the way to the border, the unaccompanied minors that we encounter, it's, a, it's sad. And, you know, the left and the Democratic Party, the establishment, they pride themselves on, oh, well, we're here for black and brown people. Well, the border crisis, it's affecting black and brown people, but they're nowhere to be found. Like, and like I said, just no urgency from the administration. I mean, they don't even address the issue. They asked, uh, a reporter asked uh, White, uh, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, when's the last time Biden's been to the border? She says, well, he drove by in 08. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> well, there you go. That's plenty. What else is he supposed to do? Don't be so demanding. Um, so we know that across the border, it's really ugly. I mean, it's terrible. They can't control it in Mexico. Even when they put effort into it, they can't control it. The border is in shambles right now. Uh, how does this start seeping into, you know, further inland to areas that are not used to dealing with a border crisis ongoing? Exactly. So when I was at the border, um, actually, I met Congressman Mike Garcia. So he's a Republican, represents District 25 back in North L.A. County. And it, what was interesting about Mr. Garcia was that 
He was the first representative from California in South Texas at the border. So I just asked Congressman, hey, Mr. Congressman, like, how come you're out here? You're like, you're like the first representative that I've seen from California come. He says, what's happening here at the border is impacting my district, which is 300 miles away. Wow. And I said, what, you know, what do you mean? Can you elaborate? He said, we have a huge Mexican drug cartel human uh, smuggling crisis happening. And this is all happening through the illegal marijuana operation. So the thing is, is when you talk about illegal marijuana, people just shrug their shoulders because they're like, oh, well, it's just Cheech and Chong out there smoking yeah. Paulus and Bob Marley. Yeah. <laughs> but they have no idea this kind of criminal element, the human trafficking, labor trafficking, the violence. And so in LA, LA County right now, they have over 500 illegal marijuana operations. And this is happening with Mexican drug cartels, the Chinese mafia, and Armenian crime organizations. And they're smuggling migrants from the border. So this, this problem starts at the border and they're smuggling these migrants, forcing them to work these illegal grows and arming the migrants because they're actually getting into uh, uh, gunfire fights with other cartels in the desert. And the sad part about it is the people who are stuck in the middle of it are just regular working class citizens that did not ask for this. Mm. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about the effect of the changing policy in the United States, for what, especially as it relates to marijuana. There's been this push for a long time for it to be legalized, and it is, and, you know, sort of. I mean, it's not federally legal, but it's legal in a bunch of states. It's legal in a bunch of cities. People are are consuming this through normal brick-and-mortar stores mm -hmm. now. Does that help the border situation, or does it hurt? I would say right now it's definitely hurting. So in, in, mm. in California, Prop 64, it passed in 2016. So what Prop 64 did is it legalized cannabis statewide, but it made a legal cultivation, which used to be a felony in California, downgraded to a misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. So this kind of, you know, let open the floodgates to this black market marijuana business where these cartels said, hey, um, we could come in and then not only uh, instead of bringing in fentanyl and stuff from, from the southern border, which they, they still do, they said we can now grow our product on American soil. And the crazy thing about this, let's say you and me had our own illegal marijuana operation in California and we get raided by the cops. Let's say we had 50,000 plants. Mm -hmm. We're going to get hit with a $500 misdemeanor ticket. So for these cartels, why would you not do this? Wow, yeah, you've taken the risk away. <laughs> right. Where's the downside? So we're seeing the policies enable this um, in California and also from the border. And like I said, the working class American citizens are stuck in the middle of these cartel wars in the desert here on, on American soil. And now we have labor trafficking in the United States. And in L.A. County, where we, we featured a documentary, there's over 500 legal grows. We also spent some time in the county next door, which is San Bernardino County. They have over a thousand. So just between two Jeez. counties in SoCal, we have close to 2,000 illegal marijuana operations. And this is not Cheech and Chong yeah. out there. These are criminal fractions that are bringing violence to these communities. The water theft is actually another big issue. So every day that these illegal marijuana grows are operating, between 3 million to 9.6 million water guns are being wasted. And for folks who live in California yeah, know yeah. that that water is everything because we're going through through a drought. So where I live in Palmdale, if I if I go past a certain gallon limit, I get I get taxed and get billed heavier. So it's a it's an issue that we're really trying to alarm um, the American citizens, the politicians, to say to do something about this already. Um, it's really confusing about how the, they expect these policies to work. I had uh, Michael Schellenberger on the other day. He wrote San Francisco, mm -hmm. and he's talking about the policies in these big progressive cities, particularly as they go to drugs. You have people on the streets who are able to use them openly all the time. You have the the, the punishments being turned down on cartels. Then you have situations like, you know, they're trying to take away your right to defend yourself with, with, with a firearm. All these policies and the open border, all these policies work together to create complete chaos. I mean, how can they not see this happening or is it part of the plan? It seems like it's part of the plan. There's no urgency from the administration. Even when the, when the 12,000 Haitians came in late, late September, they released those 12,000 Haitians into the U.S. and they did not test them uh, for COVID-19. <laughs> so that, that's the yeah, funny yeah. part is we have first responders right now, um, you know, just regular workers like nurses getting fired for not taking the vaccine, yet we're letting illegals into the country who we know are, are testing positive for COVID. So when we were down there, we were interviewing these Haitians and I would ask them on camera and they were honest, which, which I'm thankful for. And I said, have you been tested for COVID-19 before being released? They said no. So we, we got a bunch of interviews. We put them out. We put pressure on the administration. And then the DHA Secretary Mayorkas came out a few days later and said, hey, you know those 12,000 Haitians we released? <laughs> About 20% of them are testing positive for COVID. And it's like they're putting them on our buses and our planes with oh, other American God. citizens. So it's something that it's alarming. We're, 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 we're trying to get the information out there. Um, there's kind of a misconception that people that if they don't live near the border, that those issues don't affect them. But it's coming. It's the fentanyl. It's the cartels. It's the human smuggling, labor trafficking. 
and it's happening here on American soil. It's the COVID too. I mean, it's yeah, all yeah, of yeah. it together. It's fascinating when, when the when the Haitian thing was going on. I, I remember checking, and I think they were at zero point four percent vaccination rate yep. for the entire country. So I, I, <laughs> we're, we're going to fire our first responders here for not wanting the vaccine, but we're going to import twelve thousand people from a country with a zero point four percent vaccination rate. Doesn't make much sense, but none of this none of this does. Tell people again where they can find the documentary. So right now, um, two ways to find it. The easiest way is just go on our on our website, is carteldoc.com. We have our own website for. It. We're not doing the censorship with YouTube, so carteldoc.com. Mm. If you have struggle finding it, you could also just go on dailycaller.com. It's going to redirect you. But carteldoc.com, you can watch the trailer. So please send it out to you know family and friends, and then you get the full documentary right there. And I think it's going to open a lot of Americans' eyes when they see this issue. It's really important that people are aware of what's going on on the border because. For all that we know, and as bad as it's been, it's worse. Mm -hmm. It's worse. Uh, Jorge Fenduro is there to make sure you know about it. He's field reporter for The Daily Caller. The new documentary is Cartelville, USA. You can watch it now at carteldoc.com. Head there now and uh, check it out. Or maybe right after the show is probably more appropriate. I should at least, I should at least say that, right? If, if, if I'm not telling you to watch the show, who's going to tell you, right? Jorge, thanks so much for coming on the show. Hey, thank you so much.